Cultural Leaders is a series of conversations that I'm having with people from the worlds of art and design, music, technology and sport. I feel with you, you're not that obvious a cart person. <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely had to uh, tone down the accent in Germany, Jesus, if they couldn't understand the word I was saying when I was trying to present over there. It's really important that we do share these stories and that we pass them on generation to generation. I would encourage young people when they get that feeling of fear to step into it, step into fear every single time. Now is democratise how and when we consume content. It also offers opportunities to creators and creative talent, which I think is great. It's not just an entertainment platform, but I feel like it can also be an educational platform if you want it to be. The No Sky Cinema membership is like a library. It's full of old archive movies like The Quiet Man, Back to the Future, and more up-to-date modern blockbusters like Spider-Man and Star Wars. So there's a great archive of rich films that we can all relate to from our youth, as well as newer editions of those films as well. You don't have to take my word for it. You can sign up today for a free seven-day trial and explore the library of entertainment, action, and education. Growing up in Mick O'Dwyer's Kildare left a strong impression on Ryan Hennessy. He dreamed for a time of becoming a Kildare footballer until one day his music teacher asked him to sing a song as part of a school music project. What unfolded in the following years brought sold out arenas all over the world, American TV chat show performances and the birth of Ireland's newest poet. Listen, Ryan, thanks for joining me. No problem. Uh, I wanted to speak to you because I see you as one of these young leaders that I think are important to kind of Ireland at the moment. Um, important to Irish culture uh, from the point of view of what you do and how you do it. So I just wanted to shine a light on yourself and others like you so that we might be able to together, you know, show young Irish guys and girls, especially secondary and third level students, that, you know, whilst the world is kind of in flux at the moment, you know, that there are other ways of progressing and making and having a career and, um, maybe taking a chance on your talent if you think you have some. So, so um, that's basically it. I want to start, Ryan, with a, a day that we spent together in my home county of Kerry down in Killarney, Fitzgerald Stadium, Killarney, in the presence of another leader, cultural leader, cultural icon, Mick O'Dwyer. Uh, your reaction that day when Mick walked into the dressing room, Ryan, we were shooting a piece of video content for the launch of the new Kerry jersey back at the time. But your reaction when Miko walked into the dressing room one that day was interesting to me. I wondered what kind of effect he had on you and why. Yeah, I I think of that day very, very fondly. Um I was starstruck by Miko. And and I've I've only said this to someone recently that the few times I've been starstruck always seems to be by sports people rather than people in music. Um and Miko was definitely one of them because for me, growing up as a as a as a very young child, he was and such an icon in my town, in my county, in my family home. He was he was a legend. And I remember I, I met him briefly once as a child in St. Connets Park. I remember Kildare were training over there and there was loads of fans went over. My dad brought me over. I met a few of the players, um, and Miko. And that was the that was the one time that I met him. So meeting him again as an adult for me was very was very surreal because, like I said, he was he was an icon to me in my household growing up, and and of course, a cultural icon. Um, not that I knew that at the time, but it was just somebody who I who I looked up to because for me in my life when when Miko was over there, GAA was was my biggest passion at that time in my life. So meeting him as an adult was it was. It was a crazy feeling, and I, I I actually feel so grateful that that I got to meet him that day as an adult with with adult eyes. That's a great answer. I I enjoyed your reaction to him. I I felt the same way, which kind of says something about how he transcended generations and and yeah, just became this this culture like on. I felt the same way around him. Um, your GA background is probably something people don't know a lot about, and your love for GA and how much you played it. I just want to, for a start, before we go into that, talk about that time of your life, we'll say that era of Miko's Kildare, what was it like? How did you relate to that team beyond Miko? How did you relate to the players in that team? Because they were a big team at the time in the late, mid to late 90s. Yeah, they were. It was so it was so ingrained in my 
home and in my family life because my dad was just obsessed and my older brother and my sisters both of my sisters actually played GA for Kildare um and it was one thing I just remember is the I always have a really vivid memory of somehow the Sam Maguire being in my in in my house I don't know how it was I don't know how it was getting passed around the the housing estate but it was in my house at one stage and I remember just being in sitting in front of it in awe and just staring at it and getting photographs taken of it and just looking at this thing like it just fell from the sky or something it was so odd in my household um but I I really related to to that team because it was the first time because to me there were superstars I didn't know that this was just a an Irish thing I thought this was everybody knew about Kildare um as as a naive child um and then when my my dad or my brother would tell me where these guys were from it would really blow my mind um and it probably stored a subconscious kind of of realization in me that oh I can actually do whatever I want I don't I wasn't aware of that at the time but when I look back now it was probably actually a, a big thing in my life to be like I can because it was such a big thing to me I was like maybe I can realize my dreams because these guys are from my county some of them are from my town um so it probably didn't still something in me subconsciously back then to to some kind of drive I would say wow yeah brilliant and you know what I'm as you were speaking I was thinking late, late, uh, mid to late 90s he was probably 10 11 12 maybe but I'm I'm a good I'm a good bit off actually because when I think about it now you were much younger than that what age were you back then I was born in 95 so I was very very young very young yeah I'm I'm sure I'm showing my age now I, for, I forget how young you are and I forget you know the, some of the you know people like you are of a different generation to even me yeah. uh, never mind those players that were on that that uh, killed their team um that was a big part probably of your you know there was a lot of information sporting information coming into your mindset back then you are of course best known very well known now as a singer songwriter musician writer poet I think all songwriters are poets so I, I, I would consider you I would consider you a poet but I think it's interesting to to look at from a cultural point of view the impact that GA uh, tends to have on every young fellow in Ireland no matter what kind of what he's doing now there's always somewhere along the line there's an influence um, you play, how much of it did you play? I know we speak, we speak a lot about soccer, you and I, we watch a lot of United, we speak a good bit about soccer. How did actually the playing of Gaelic football in general, how important was it to you as a young fella? I think it was important for many things. I think it was important for, I think it was a confidence builder because I remember sitting on my steps at home in my house and it was going to be the first time that I was going to go to to GAA training first time ever it was actually it would have been under eights and I was about six or seven and I remember sitting on my steps in my house as a kid being very nervous because I'd never done anything like that before I'd always just played around on the street or whatever but for some reason that was daunting to me and I remember sitting on the steps crying as a child and saying to my dad I don't want to go I'm, I'm scared like and I just remember him saying to me you don't have to go if, if you don't want to go you don't have to go um but eventually I did build up the courage to and I remember just being on a pitch like that it was the first time because I grew up playing on the street I'd never been on a pitch before um, and it was my first time being on an open pitch with people my age who all had the same interest in in GA as me and I remember it just giving me so much confidence because I was so nervous before going there but as soon as I got onto the pitch and I had something in common with all of these people it just lifted me and I think it gave me a great confidence and continued to give me confidence for for years while I played. Um, and I think as in the later years, and when I say later years, I stopped playing GA when I turned about 14 for a couple of years. And then I went back when I was around 16. But it, it definitely gave me discipline, I would say. Soccer and Gaelic definitely gave me discipline and gave me kind of a sense of accountability that I'm responsible for something um, because I was the captain of, of my GA team. So I felt, even at a very young age, I felt that kind of sense of responsibility and putting a team on your back and, and, and going after something. And I loved that feeling. I've carried it into music, for sure. You won a lot growing up, right? Yeah, we did. We won a couple of leagues. Um, I think it would have been, again, very young, maybe under 12s, under 14s, I captained the tie. Um, from centre half back. I remember you telling me a story about being captain of a team, and uh, as you lifted the cup, 
everybody, your teammates were chatting your nickname, which was, I think, Mad Dog, you told me, Mad, was your nickname? Mad Dog, yeah. <laughs> Mad Dog, yeah, I remember you telling me that. I think it was after Glenn Ryan, actually, the Kildare footballer, am I right? It was, yeah, I was obsessed with Glenn Ryan as, as, as a kid, and that's what, that's what he was referred to as. So I think I probably told everybody at that time to call me Mad Dog because I was so obsessed with him. I don't, I don't know if they just picked it up. <laughs> Um, but I do remember yeah. that. Well, I, play, I played against I played against him. I can tell you, he was a, he was a hard he he, he was a hard dog. Um, uh, you mentioned there, Ryan, about uh, playing that element of performance as a footballer. I know you now for a couple of years. I see the change in you from the guy that I know when we chat, we have a coffee or whatever, and the guy that performs. I recognise the change in personality. Mm-hmm. Was that was that change in personality apparent as a as a footballer as well when you were young? You know, were you the more reserved, quiet, or thoughtful type of guy that transformed then when you went down to the playing pitch like you do on the stage? Yeah, definitely. There's a, there's a direct correlation between the two. I think um, I've always been quite a laid back kind of person, but on stage I'm a different animal. And then it was the same. I'm walking onto a pitch. I was a different animal. Um, I loved. What was I your loved, style? What was your style on the pitch? What was your style on the pitch like? Well, I was centre half back, um, but I was quite an attacking one. I remember in in those couple of leagues, I believe, if I remember correctly, I was the the leading scorer on the team from centre half back. So I was I was kind of a I would drive from centre half back. I was aggressive, um, strong kind of kind of player. Now I wasn't any bigger than anybody else, but I was just aggressive and hungry. And that's the, the style of player. Were you, were you for a man for a man with vocals for a man with big vocals? Were you vocal? Yeah, I would have been at that time. I I, I know as I went on, the way it worked out as it went on, I started to become playing kind of two years ahead of myself. So I started to become kind of the younger, and in the younger echelons of the team. So I became probably less vocal as I went on. But at that time, for those leagues, I, I would have been the vocal player. And was Kildare football an ambition at the time? You know, were you looking around at at that age, for 13, 14, 15, whatever it might have been, and was Kildare playing inter-county football for Kildare an ambition at the time? Absolutely. It was all I wanted to do. Up, up until around that age of around 13, 14, all I wanted to do was, was play for Kildare. And I remember one year getting the option to I could either be the captain again because it was the manager's way of being fair because there was a couple of us that were were better than than the others naturally at the time and to, kind of his way of divvying out responsibility to us was you can either he said to me you can go to the Kildare trial or you can be the captain because I have to send someone to the Kildare trial I have to let someone be the captain um, and I remember at the time picking being captain for for a tie and I remember looking back on that being like I hope that was the right decision because it was kind of the be all and end all for me. Um, at that time, it was such a serious decision, but I was only 13, 14, whatever I was. Um, but playing for Claire was all I wanted to do, really, that and and and, and play for a tie. But th- definitely, that was all I wanted to do at that age. Great. A lot of people wouldn't know that. A um, tough decision or tough choice to get to at that age, by the way, you know, yeah. captain your club or go for the trial is, uh, yeah. is, not, is not an easy one. Um, uh, a tie in general, Ryan. Since I've known you, I've started to kind of become interested in a tie as a town. And I've read, a, I've read a bit about it. It has a strong creative streak. It does. What, what, what do you think it is? I, I, I know we've discussed in the past some of the people that have come out of a tie. What do you think it is? Who are those people that you know identify or give a tie its identity and its creativity? I think a tie has a mad streak in it, and I think madness and creativity are intertwined in many ways. Um, and that goes for anything. I think whether it be sport or music or or writing or whatever it is, it's a place. I grew up around so many amazing characters. They should really make a movie about Thai because it would be it would be amazing, the, with the people that came from there. Um, and the environment that I grew up in. But I think it's crazy because it has a lot of ties. Like it has a loose ties to like the likes of Johnny Marr from the Smiths. His parents are from a Thai. Manny from the Stone Roses. His parents are from a Thai. Um, and they actually grew up on the same road as um, our bass player Cliff. The three of them on on the one road, their their parents. Um, so for me, even even recently, Manny was in a tie because they unveiled a plaque for him, and he was asking out because we we had been just playing the we had just played the Five Nights at the Tree Arena at the time, and he was asking everybody around the tie, who's this picture, this band that everybody keeps telling me about. And to me, I was like, oh my god, Manny knows the name of my band. You know what I mean? Because Stone Roses, Oasis, that whole thing is everything to me that's what I grew up on um but even it's crazy to, to know that people like that are are intertwined with a tie and then there's 
then there's more obvious ones like like ourselves um yourselves ja- jack l right yeah jack l jack l jack l was, J- john minahan there's a man called john minahan who's a photographer who's kind of regarded as one of the first ever paparazzi photographers in the uk actually he came from a tie there is actually a film online about a tie actually that i've watched that it's actually this chap john minahan who's going around the town visiting bars and pubs with a with a handheld camera back i would say early 80s and it's actually a really interesting watch from the point of view of a local uh, of feeling the local culture of a thai i think I, I thought it was very interesting of any village not just a thai but um i didn't know about the manny link yeah. big united fan of course like the two of us yeah. can't go wrong um i went through a big stone roses fans i think i think most irish guys went through a stone stone roses kind of a phase be it passing or deep they were a band that really penetrated the culture here right yeah, I think for me, I was only talking to somebody about this recently as well. Because for me, it, I didn't, I didn't have any idea who the Stone Roses were because they were again. I was born in ninety five; they had been and gone. Um, I just remember, I got into music through like finding um, what's the story, Morning Glory CD in my brother's room and turning that on and being like, "What is this? This it blew my mind." Just the, the um, the aggression in the guitars. I remember having a striking effect on me and then just the I was just able it was weird because I was able to relate to them because I could hear the Manchester accent and most of my family live in Manchester so I was uh, they were instantly relatable to me and then the more I looked into them and I seen where they came from their humble beginnings they were from a council estate and all of this again I think was a subconscious impression on me that oh I could actually do that as well um, and then through them, I got into the Stone Roses and, and things like that. But I, I missed the whole thing. Um, I missed Oasis even because, I, again, I was too young when they were still yeah. touring. So, yeah, I had a similar moment with Oasis. I discovered Oasis on a ferry on a ferry to France. Uh, we were going on a school tour and it was like cassette tapes at the time. And I somebody had somebody had definitely maybe. Right. I think that was the first Oasis album, right? Definitely. definitely maybe, yeah. Maybe. yeah. I think so. And I remember hearing that for the first time and I was like, well, I, I, I was just hooked on Oasis from then. But um, Ryan, w- yeah, a tie to me from the outside, you've just, you've just explained it. Real creative talent, a lot of talent in the town as well. You look at the sporting side, the football, soccer, rugby, Joy Carberry's from there. You grew up with Joy Carberry, right? Yeah. Um, talent and creativity seems to be a thing. Um, I want to talk to you about your school, your time in school, and kind of how you related to school um, with regard to subjects. What, what, you, what, what were you good at, given, the, given who you are now? How do you look back at the subjects you, ta- you learned and how did you relate to them? I think I, I, str- I didn't struggle in school. I never, I was always all right, but I think I struggled to care about a lot of the subjects. and I. F- when I look back now, I think it's because of the way that they were taught to me. Because, for example, English was the subject that I was best at and it was the one I enjoyed the most. But at the same time, I feel like it it tainted my love of poetry for a couple of years because of how it was taught to me very, very, in a way that I don't feel poetry should be taught. I don't know how you can teach poetry even. For me, it's a it's kind of a involuntary expression that I use. So for me, it kind of sitting down and writing notes on poems and all of that kind of thing, really kind of, it stunted my love of words for a while, which I don't like when I look back on it, but still English was my favorite subject because it was, it was what I was best at. I know for my junior shirt, I was in the top like 20% of English students. Um, I remember that statistic coming out, but I don't know what happened then after that. I discovered women and everything else then in transition year and lost the kind of, by the time I got to the leaving start, I don't think I was as good as, as a junior start. But English was my biggest love and then maths was my biggest hate, still is. I always struggle. Maths used to make me feel very stupid because I wasn't aware at the time that people are good at certain things and not so good at other things. But for me, how I used to feel in maths class really affected me because I felt stupid I felt like I was I felt like I was dumb in that class and I don't think anybody ever really nurtured me in terms of being like you're not stupid for being bad at one subject but again I don't I don't know how any teacher would kind of know because I never would have put that across 
but I think school was an important time for me because I met a lot of people who influenced me like friends and stuff like that and also this the sporting aspect of school I had a great PE teacher Mr Quinn um who I, I who I'm very fond of who always encouraged and nurtured um sport and there was a great teacher in there Tom Nolan Mr Nolan who was also career guidance who was just mad into soccer and Gaelic and he'd call you into the <laughs> for career guidance but all he'd talk about was football and I I remember I remember not knowing what I wanted to do at leave and start. And I remember him just calling me into his office to say, what do you want to do? And I was like, I like music and I like football, but I don't know what I can do with either of those passions. And he kind of suggested some great things for me that I didn't go for in the end, but like the the soccer course in Carlo IT and there's some music colleges. Um, but there was, I think fondly of school in, in many ways, in terms of the people and a lot of the teachers were very, were very helpful and nurturing. But then when I, I also still have nightmares about school where if I, I have dreams that I'm still in school and I wake up sweating, panting because I, I, I wouldn't go back for any money for any length of time. What were you up to? <laughs> I just, no. I found, I found the restraints of school very stressful and hard on, on my brain just to kind of, the routine, do you find, yeah, sometimes yeah. with creative people, you know, the routine of school goes against the grain from the point of view of your mind. Your mind works in a different way and the routine kind of can can, can dull the creativity a little bit. Big time. Um, but I'm glad, I'm glad, that's a great synopsis of your time and I'm glad to hear it because we're talking to lots of second and third level students through this show and we're shining a light on probably the fact that, yeah, school, you know, you may be bad at one subject, good at another focus on the good, try and drive into that as a kind of a career direction. And this kind of, these conversations are as much career guidance as anything else from the point of view that, you know, okay, you can't go to school at the moment. You don't know what your third level future looks like. You don't know what the employment kind of landscape looks like. But there are people in the country like you, okay, listen, not everybody can be a front man in a band, but you may have a talent. You discovered your talent, you know, that was, that was something I wanted to speak to you about as well. Um, and I feel like somehow you discovered a true language and true English. Is that is that a fair point? Yeah, definitely. Because I, I would have start, I started writing poetry when I was around seven, um, because my granddad writes writ poetry and my dad. Um, so I kind of discovered that early on, and then I started writing. Um, I started writing my own kind of. The first poem I ever wrote was my granddad um, passed away, and I wanted to like mark my respect to him. So I. I wrote a poem to, to leave on his grave and that's my earliest memory of writing. And then I remember getting into school and being like, kind of, I wasn't aware that there was other people who write out there. I kind of thought naively as a seven year old, my granddad and my dad were the only kind of writers. But I remember getting into school and seeing all these books and all of that and being like, wow, this is like, people can write books and people can write plays and people can do all of these amazing things and school school was the only because I don't think if maybe if I never went to school I probably wouldn't have stayed going with writing and stuff because I never probably would have realized that it was a it was an outlet to be honest um maybe I would have through through my dad and, and, and my family but it was definitely a great realization that I had once I started school that writing is something that's achievable and I think it's important as well that people start to more relatable people start to release bodies of work and start to write more because for me in school anybody that I ever studied or anything like that just seemed very out of reach and very it was kind of put across like poetry and writing were was done by these kind of people who almost don't exist if you know what I mean they're almost like these whimsical figures yeah these words were academics yeah. and uh, academics and yeah, yeah. I guess Shakespeare and words yeah. In, in, and inaccessible people. yeah yeah but as, as I got older I started to to discover people like Brendan Bean who I know you're also a, a great fan of um people like him and people who are I can instantly relate to um and I just wish that that was more ingrained in education in Ireland um maybe it is now I don't know but um Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well that's actually fundamental to this actually this series of conversations actually is the creation of new reference points if we can. Right. That point point to 
point to some of the things that you just spoke about in terms of, you know, one thing I think I think a lot about is like expression and like the Irish, the Irish man's relationship with how he expresses himself. You know, we, we, we lived through the first lockdown, if you remember, Ryan, and another Kildare man. And I'm interested in this kind of gene that seems to be in Kildare people around expression, people like Christy Moore, yourself. And of course, through the first lockdown, we discovered Paul, Paul Meskell and his character in um, Normal People. A guy who reminds me, the character reminded me of you, of you a little bit, actually, watching him, you know, kind of thoughtful, pensive, not that expressive verbally in person. But then Paul Meskell's character turns out to be a brilliant writer of English, goes on to become a brilliant English student, and it was through writing he expressed himself. You were a bit like that through writing and through music, I feel. Do you see a kind of a similarity there between the character, the guy, Paul Meskell, or his character in yourself? Yeah, I would. I know what you mean in terms of there's kind of a separation within me um, of I'm kind of two different people um, like you alluded to earlier on in the chat. And I think it, it, that character is as well. He's very, I think it's, uh, there's a great thing that that touched on as well, where he's almost, I think he, you get the impression that he's almost embarrassed of his, of his, um, of his intelligence and his emotional intelligence at points. Um, to his friends and I just remember as a being younger you mean he's afraid he's afraid to express the sentiments that he's thinking and that is it yeah yeah and I, I think I would have been like that um in terms of where I the, the atmosphere that I grew up in writing poetry or writing in any sense was it's not cool where I grew up it just that's that's not cool it's not my friends were not into anything like that so I would have kind of kept that to myself in a way and I feel like his character was was doing the same. He was keeping that kind of, um, that kind of side of him to himself, and it's almost repressed. But thankfully, in in the show, he doesn't allow it to to remain repressed, and I didn't allow it to remain repressed either. So I think there is a lot of correlation with with the character. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's an Irish thing in many ways, and it's 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 a, that kind of inability to to express in a certain way and finding another way to express. Then you know. Yeah. I think that's that that kind of expression is important for Irish guys, especially younger guys coming through now that they have that ability to do it. It's also good to see a revival in terms of Irish poets, kind of like yourself. I know I used to read a lot of Jay Z stuff when I was younger, and I remember Jay Z writing in an inter or saying in an interview one time that he was actually a poet in real life, not a songwriter or a rapper, but a poet. Yeah. And uh, I think I think he and you and that kind of. Um, Poetry and music, I think, is a, is a good way of kind of uh, making that form of expression more digestible to guys, you know. Yeah. Um, Ryan, there was, a, there was a lyric, speaking of expression and writing, you have a lyric in a song, I think it's you, you and I, and it's something like, uh, what's that smell, lives in my nose, drunken old men, laughing at my claws. Yeah. That was early in my time knowing you, and uh, I, I, I wondered, that lyric kind of resonated with me a little bit, and I wondered what kind of experience informed it. Uh, that was... If any, if any. Oh, no, a, a lot of experience informed it. Um, as a, I've always been interested in, in, I don't like the word fashion, in style and expressing myself through clothes and that, what I wear. Um, from a very from a young age and again where where I'm from at the time anyway uh, there was nobody I could relate to like in terms of that not one person I couldn't think I didn't know one person who was also passionate and interested in that kind of thing so I would always be the odd one out in terms of how I would dress um even in my friend group and still I suppose in in my friend groups but I always was very comfortable with it so I never there was a lot of time where people on a night out and a night out in a tie when I'm standing there in, in leather trousers and a see-through top probably with a shirt over it and I'm covered in tattoos as a 18 year old for a lot of people it's very jarring for them because they've never experienced it before but for me it felt normal and it was normal and I never felt uncomfortable or I never felt anytime anybody said something to me or became I don't know, people would sometimes maybe laugh or would say, "What?" I'd always get the, what are you wearing? Or what, what, like that kind of thing. But it never, it never got to me. I think because of my 
my my home life was so accepting of expression in general that I didn't think twice about wearing what I wanted to wear or anything like that. But I always got the the usual on on a night out. What are you wearing? Who do you think you are? Um, all of that kind of thing. I actually remember. <laughs> I don't know if I ever told you this. I remember one time being in a chipper after a pub on the night out, and I can't remember what I was wearing, but I remember a guy turning around and saying to me, um, <laughs> he was like, "You think you think you're Paul Galvin? Like what? What? Like what? What are you wearing? Like I actually remember that. It's only coming back to my brain now, but I remember at the time thinking it's a weird thing to say, um, because of because you had you're definitely known um where I'm from anyway and, and in rural kind of towns like that as as um somebody who expresses themselves through how they dress and I think that was his only point of contact in his brain was wait you're an Irish guy dressing how you want to dress <laughs> and that was his only way of computing in his brain yeah um well I'm glad I, I, I'm glad I didn't get you into a fight anyway. <laughs> no not that time not that time <laughs> Um, no, it's a very interesting dynamic that it's a challenge to kind of Irish manliness, you know, it has been, I think it has changed, but, you know, uh, for a time, that kind of style and uh, whatever was a challenge to manliness and that, but, you know, I think guys are getting used to it now. Um, Ryan, you mentioned your home life there, and I wanted to ask you if you remember the first time you ever performed a song. Yeah, it was, again, and I, I meant to actually touch on that when we were talking about school. School is what I have to thank for for my career, because... It was through the music class as a subject in school that I discovered this that I could sing, and that I had uh, that I was able to use music as as an expression because I had to choose for my leaving cert between woodwork and music. I'm terrible at anything DIY, anything like that. Woodwork, any of that, just it's a no go. So I was, music was actually my only option, um, and I'm so grateful that it was because I got in there and the teacher cause it was kind of like you have to do a practical exam which means you either do music programming on a computer or you play an instrument or you sing. I had no idea how to do musical programming on a computer, never played an instrument in my life. So I was like, right, well, I may just sing. And I genuinely, people tend to not believe me when I say it, but I genuinely had never sang before or tried to sing or thought I could sing. Um, so I just went into it blindly. And I, I'm a massive fan, as you as you'd know, of of Irish music, folk music, traditional music, particularly Luke Kelly and the Dubliners. And there was a song that I became obsessed with as a teenager called Come My Little Son that I heard Luke Kelly singing. Um, and the teacher had said to me, you're going to have to come in tomorrow and sing for me. And I was like, I have no idea what I'm going to sing. I've never sang before. I better go home and, and, and try and sing. And I went up to my room and <laughs> go home and try and just... Sing. Yeah, I na I naturally just went to that song for some reason. It just felt right. It was a song that I knew every word of. And I started singing it to myself, and then I was like, "I better road test this before going back into school and and making a show of myself." And I remember my dad was downstairs, and I kept walking from my bedroom down the stairs and walking past the sitting room door. I kept going to go in to be like, "Can I sing for you?" But every time I'd get to the door, I just walk past, and I did that around ten times, and eventually eventually built up the courage and burst in the door and said to my dad can I sing for you and he kind of looked at me so perplexed and just being like yeah yeah you can sing for me of course you can but where like he had no he was like where is this coming from he was so confused uh, rightly so I'd never had, even showed any interest in in music um and I told him to close his eyes and I closed my eyes and I sang come my little son um from start to finish and he was even more perplexed once he opened his eyes um, and heard heard my voice, and I was as well by his reaction because that was the, that was the first ever acknowledgement of he was like holy shit you can sing he's like where did that voice come from, and I was like I have no idea that's my first time I ever tried to sing, um, but it was the it was I've had such an amazingly supportive household that it's it's always. There was no reason for me to be walking past the, sit the sitting room door, if you know what I mean, 10 times, because if I went in there and I couldn't sing, it's that he still would have been as equally as supportive of me. But it was that acknowledgement that, wow, you have a great voice that made me go, all right, well, I'm going into school tomorrow to sing for these then.
and that was the start of my whole musical career my musical journey yeah that's a great story i love that inspired by school and by home it comes true in your songs as well in your music you know your relationship with your home and your, your parents especially um i've always wondered ryan because I'm going to go back now to when I was probably that teenage guy, late teens maybe, I would have spent a lot of time on rapgenius.com. At the time it was called rapgenius.com, so it was annotations on rap lyrics and hip hop lyrics by all the artists, like great side. I used to love it. And, and I would just, just delve into what they were trying to say and what they meant and that kind of thing. And I've always wondered, this is a question for you now, this is a, this is a hard one for you now, but I've always wondered, how do you write a song? It. How do you write a song? I understand its lyrics, but the re- I, I, I just don't. I just do not understand the rest. Yeah, it 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 depends. It changes all the time. I found recently, there, for the first kind of couple of years of songwriting, I think that there, I had one way of doing it, and I stuck to that. I would just sit down with my guitar, acoustic guitar, kind of play the same three chords, and it would just be Jimmy from the band always described it as word vomit from me, where. I some certain people sit down and they work on a melody and they do the melody from start to finish and then they put lyrics to it and other people start with lyrics and but for me lyric and melody came at the same time but for whatever reason I don't know why and I I it, but it just did it was kind of a spill of lyric and melody at the same time and oftentimes I'd just start and whatever came out would come out and then I'd build from there and that's one way of doing it and I still do it like that but then there's other ways of Jimmy might come to me with a track and be like, I worked on this piece of music. And then sometimes he'll have a melody. And I'll just put words to his melody. Or there's other times where I've been collaborating with people a lot lately um, for other artists and, and, for, and for ourselves. And I find for the first time collaboration to be very exciting because I was always very, I'm not collabor- I, I write by myself um, just because I was comfortable in that. And I don't want to be in a room with 10 writers and I never would be. Um, but I found actually there's a great there's something magic about collaboration when it comes to writing a song because I work I, I've been writing a lot with with Danny from the script lately on on a couple of projects and he has a great way of leaving things under my nose for me to develop. He will say something that's a ballpark statement, and knowing that I'm going to pick something from it, and I know when he's doing it. And I instantly, like, he, it's like he leaves me gold there and I just pick it up, if you know what I mean. And I found that kind of collaborative way of writing. Mm-hmm. Um, sounds like good, sounds like good coaching. It, it really is. Sounds like good coaching and a good, and a good mentor to have there and that little, that little soundbite. Yeah. And he is, he's, he's a, he's an amazing mentor in terms of everything, in terms of the business of music, in terms of songwriting, in terms of how to deal with the, the pressures and deal with fame and. He's an amazing guy for that. Um, and it's funny, you, say, you said that you consider um, all songwriters to be poets because he's actually the first guy that I've met that kind of denied that personally to himself. He was like, because I would show him some of my poetry and stuff and he he, he says that he can't write poetry. So like, he, he doesn't know how to do it, but he, he's a songwriter. So I've, I found that very interesting because I think a lot of people will take the word poet and be like, well, yeah, well, I am. Um, and for me that that word I know I'm straying off a little bit here but that word for me I've only really found power in recently because I used to be afraid to say I'm a poet because I think it's a, it's a charged word in a way because it's almost as if it's almost as if saying I am a poet you're kind of it sounds like you're bragging or to me for a long time it sounded like I'm but it's not because I am a poet I was a poet before I was a songwriter, before I was a singer, before I played football, before anything. I The first thing I ever did, my earliest memory, one of my earliest memories is writing a poem. So I am a poet, but I've always been afraid to say that until recently. I've found power in the word and I'm not bragging by saying I'm a poet. It's just one form of expression. I express myself through poetry, through music, through clothes, through tattoos, through football, through all of these things. That's what I've come to realize is that my life is a series of expressions and I'm just constantly finding a new form to, to do it in. And it's a very exciting journey looking for a new form of expression all the time. It's great. It's a great message to the young guys and girls listening in to, you know, these students that are probably maybe at a loose end at the moment um, and trying to figure things out. I think that's a great message. Um, I wanted to go back to the start and talk a bit more about performance. 
you're wearing your United jersey there. We probably see each other. I don't know how we relate to each other. I think we probably relate to each other mostly through sport or communicate with each other mostly through sport, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Obviously, obviously, there's like we speak about we speak about a lot of things, but we speak about sport a lot. Tell me, when I watch you perform, I see lots of energy and lots of athleticism, and I see a certain style as well. How do your clothes? You spoke about fashion and style being a form of expression for you. How do your clothes and what you wear on stage affect or, or add to your, your performance as a, as a frontman? There, it's a very, very, very important aspect to me, not just, because, not just because I love clothes and express myself through that, but it can really put me in a zone. What I'm wearing can really, and it might, I think it, it sounds a bit mad when I say it out loud like that. <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know if it's, it's if that's very relatable. Maybe it is, but depending on what I'm wearing, will really kind of decide. It decides my mood every day, really. The energy. Yeah, yeah. and and I think when I put on something before, usually, as of late, I've I wear a lot of suits and stuff like that on stage. And when I put on a, a well fitted suit, that that I feel great and I feel strong and I feel, I feel outward when when i put it on if you know what i mean and then it's kind of easy then to walk onto stage and 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 translate that feeling to to an audience um and there, it, I, I think in terms of relating it back to football it was the same way um i went to see my my team in in a tie called clamullion my family club <clears throat> and i went to see them play in the cup final a couple of years ago and they got a brand new kit and it was an all white kit and Clamullion colours are blue and yellow or black over the years. It's always been that. But this kit was an all white kit with black going through it. And everybody always asks me whenever I get back to go and see a game, they're always like, You must you must miss it terribly. And I do. Um but the thing I I was raging, I was like, I would have loved to walk onto the pitch in that kit, in that all white kit. I just know I would have felt amazing and I know it would have impacted my game that day in an amazing sense. And it did when I played football. The, the the boots that I wore and how I wore how I wore the kit impacted how I played. And it's the exact same as what I wear on stage impacts how I'm going to carry myself. And it's it's very important. I think it's very important for everybody, but maybe not everybody is as aware of it as p- people like myself or yourself are because we're interested in that. But it's definitely it affects energy in a big way yeah well hopefully there'll be a bit of discovery you know throughout this series speaking to the various people no more none more so than yourself there might be some discovery or some some kind of um you know new thinking amongst kind of young people in terms of how the, how they relate to clothes and how clothes can relate to how they relate in the world and how they're perceived in the world as well um ryan you've moved to london we're in the middle currently of a, a third lockdown, as everybody knows about. What's it been like for you since you've moved? How has how has um, how have you experienced the city and the culture of the city as an Irishman? It's um, I've come here for a while. It's obviously it's obviously much different. It's obviously much different to what it would be normally. Yeah, it is. I've co- I've come here for a while just to see um, how I find it. I've come just because of the whole COVID thing obviously work is very restricted but here there's still you can still work in certain studios with certain people at, at socially distanced um so i've come here just for that reason um and i found it great i'm in Hampstead at the minute which is a brilliant part of london because it feels it's got the best of both worlds because camden is five minutes away on the tube which is a great it's just so full of culture and life and character and then Hampstead is kind of the polar opposite in terms. It's, it's also full of life and culture and character, but in a very different way. This is a very laid back um, area full of, full of I, th- I think Hampstead would be home to a lot of poets over the years and a lot of people of that kind of ilk, that kind of English. Yeah, that, that kind of that kind of thing. And then I think Camden is home to a lot of music and art and that kind of thing. So it's a great place that I'm situated right now. Um, obviously it's been a very different experience of the city because I haven't been able to experience it in, in, in full flow and I always had a I always had a weird thing about London in my head where I associated it with um, work I'd always come over on 
same day flights come over do a meeting go back to ireland so i was like, associated london with like stress and <clears throat> and work but now I, I i think of it very differently it's a it's a great place and it's been great for for writing music and and poetry and and just realizing ideas and i have space to you said a great thing to me one time about not letting down your ideas and i never i had never thought about that before there's a responsibility when you have an idea that you're passionate about and that you know could work to not let it down and the space that i'm in here allows me to not do that uh, which i'm very grateful for i can realize a lot of things here yeah, I sense from speaking to you over the weeks and months that you're in a great, for the last six months or 12 months even, I feel like you've been in a really great creative space and I think that's probably partly down to the, down to the probably how the world has changed and the kind of solitude, but also maybe your environment and being in London and, um, you know, having a new, new kind of stimulations and inspirations. Um, Ryan, all those years ago, you started up Picture This, you were in your bedroom, on your own, had dreams and ambitions and and talent or uh, you felt you had talent and you felt you had to do something with it um what would you say to the young people boys and girls around the country today that are maybe be maybe in a little bit of a void at the moment unsure about what's ahead some of them may feel that they have that intuition inside that talent inside that ability inside but are struggling maybe to find the outlet or the the the, the platform from, from which to kind of uh find themselves would you have any advice for them yeah, I, I I think I would plead, I'd actually plead with young men and women to just just defiantly follow your instinct. That like and I mean defiantly follow it. We uh, me and, and and Jimmy are so defiant in, in what we do in terms of we listen to ourselves when it comes down to it, we take advice from everybody, but we listen to ourselves and we know ourselves what we want and and how to achieve it and i think it's so important for somebody asked me recently what's one piece of advice you'd give to a musician and i flippantly said a, a, a young musician I, I flippantly said don't listen to anybody and i know that sounds like a weird piece of advice because you should listen to people but when it comes down to it you know better than anybody and don't let anybody don't let anybody dampen that kind of passion or 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 desire that you have i yeah, I think it's great to dream as big as you possibly can because why not? That's the thing that I realized is why not? Why would you not dream as big as you possibly can and why would you not chase after it? And I think it's if somebody else is uncomfortable with your dream, good. Good. Cuz that means you're dreaming big and it's it's not your responsibility. They are not your responsibility. If somebody else is uncomfortable with how how inspired you are and how driven you are and how much you want to achieve something good they should be everybody should be don't allow that to be a negative thing on you because it's only a reflection on 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 that person and that's something that i realized very early on is just be defiantly aspirational and i think intention and attention have an intention here and focus your attention right now to get to that intention i think is is key in that and I just want young men and women to 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 just not be afraid. Just there, there's there's it's just a waste of time. It's just a waste of time to be afraid of of following what you actually desire. Just follow it. What's the worst that can happen? Just do it. I did it. And I'm not saying that it's that easy. You have to do a lot of things, like I'm talking about attention to intention. And there's a lot of hard work. But just I would actually plead with them to please just follow it because it will always pay off in some way no matter what and i would uh, i would encourage young people when they get that feeling of fear to step into it step into fear every single time and it will pay off it will pay off for you yeah i know you raise a great point and it's funny you know this 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 intuition or this this kind of uh instinct that you might have it could very well come through an academic subject as well as a non-academic area like music or or, 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 or fashion or whatever it might be you know like I I believe like people like you have probably transcended or you've stepped outside the academic kind of a thing you're you're your own kind of your talent was your qualification and your degree in a way you know yeah. but I think equally like what you just mentioned there about following that 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 intuition that can 
That can be through a school subject just as easily. It can be the discovery that, you know what, English is your thing. Do you know what, maths is your thing. And, and, and let that lead you. Equally, I think creative people struggle with the, whereas the kind of academic has the pathway with the subject, the creative mightn't have the obvious pathway. It's just talent and intuition and kind of it's more of a blind, it's more of a blind kind of a faith, you know? Yeah. And I think you raise a good point. You raise a very good point. You mentioned Jimmy as well, who I, I love how you, how you get on and relate to each other. He's great for you. You're great for him. Another highly talented guy who's kind of in his own little lane, you know, as a producer. I, he reminds me of Diplo. I, I think he's a highly talented guy. And um, similar to yourself in that, probably there wasn't a course or a college or a school that was going to teach him what he knows. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. He was... It was funny because Jimmy was actually given the option of leaving school. His parents gave him the option of of leaving school because he was there was a music school in I believe it was New York or London interested in Jimmy when he was fifteen or sixteen, and he had the option to leave school and go there or continue in school. And his parents were kind of like, "You maybe should go and do the music thing because it's what you're passionate about." But Jimmy actually stayed in school because he wanted to finish out his school life with his friends. I always found that amazing. I always thought that was an amazing thing because I know if that was offered to me out the door in two seconds, I wouldn't even have thought twice about it. I would have been gone. So I always found that an, an amazing thing for him. But yeah, school was school for us was a great starter in what we are now. We needed that, but we don't. We but we didn't need to stay within the the academic route. But again, there's a lot of people who will and should because it's equally as equally as important as what we do. Yeah, academics have the, have the infrastructure and the pathway probably non-academics don't, but it still means you have to be probably braver. The non, non-academic, creative, talented type probably has to be that bit braver without the infrastructure that the academic type have around him. But both have to kind of go for it. And, you know, you raised the point. I always felt the Irish man back in the day was a very expressive, mature, kind of a manly guy, you know, when I think back to kind of the dance hall days and kind of the 50s and 60s when guys were dressing up on a Sunday to go to the dances and that like and you know we were kind of a really ex confident kind of a country for a while we, we, we lost our way a little bit but um, <clears throat> Ryan you just released a song I always felt you were a brilliant kind of a, a conduit for the times or a translator of the times in terms of your ability to understand cultural moments and put them put them into songs and lyrics and that kind of thing. Your latest song is called Things Are Different. I saw the title there a few weeks ago and I thought, I thought, he's, he's nailed it again with this song, no, no doubt. Um, things are so different for everybody right now. Students, second, third level students, even people maybe who've just left university and gone into the workplace to see the work force, to see their workplace disappear. Um, do you think, do you think, Ryan, that you're different? over the last six to 12 months? Do you think you've changed? Yeah, I do. I think the thing for me personally is that it gave, this whole thing gave me time to work on myself uh, for the first time in, in, in a long time. And kind of, it gave me, because since we, we started the band in 2015 and we've been touring then since 2016. So this is actually the first time I've stopped in five years. Um, and it's, it's, against my own will as it is with anybody else but it's the first time I've actually had time and space to look within myself and develop and work on certain aspects of myself and kind of deal with a lot of stuff that I had never dealt with just stuff you know what I mean and I think that's changed me in 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 a great way and I know just from my the team um the picture is team and everybody is very aware of a change in me and uh, the the I, it gets said to me quite a lot because I have I've just I've just I've just went inward and just looked at myself and improved on myself and that in turn only improves on my relationships with people and my, you mean personal personal development type stuff yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah that's great I, well that's a great that's a great use of that's a great use of the the time and the solitude and the silence and uh, the uh, the downtime, isn't it? It is, and I, I think it was it was very necessary. I think it's important. The thing, I, the, my best way to describe it is, I've unlearned a lot of, I've unlearned a lot of things rather than learned things. I've unlearned a lot of negative 
behaviors within my own head and negative outlooks on myself i've been unlearning this kind of um opinion of myself that was kind of conditioned on me in a way through my environment and through people over the years and i'm spent and i'm still doing i'm unlearning negative mind frames and i'm very conscious of making sure that my approach to myself and my relationship with myself is a tender one and it's an open one and it's a real one it's not a negative one and i've learned really to i've just learned about myself i know myself now i don't think i actually knew myself before lockdown i think i think i knew what i liked and what i didn't like but there's a big difference between knowing what you like and what you want and actually knowing yourself and i think now for the first time in my life i know myself and i like myself and i don't think i would have been able to say i like myself before but now I can and I think it's a very healthy way to be and I would encourage anybody to to kind of be as objective about themselves as possible and just look after look after yourself look after your your mind it's very important yeah that's great that's a powerful way to that's a powerful message to to wrap this chat up in Ryan and uh, I think a lot of that will resonate with everybody not just not just students but adults as well listening in so um i want to i want to thank you it's great to connect again we haven't spoken in a while yeah. in person um or, or um we haven't spoken in a while so it's been great to connect with you i i just see a great leader in you i think you're important you're an important reference point for for, for young people in ireland um i think you're showing young irish people a new way of being a much healthier way of living and expressing and accepting yourself and being being true to yourself so you know that's why i wanted to chat to you i think you're a great young leader in our culture that other young people can look up to so thanks for the chat and i'll speak to you again soon okay nice one thank you paul